This episode is brought to you by Marrakez, building spaces for life. Marrakez is a leading mixed-use developer in Egypt with an ever-growing portfolio of commercial and residential projects. Visit www.marrakez.net for more information. I think that some of the most incredible parts and moments in the films that I make have come from happy accidents or mistakes. Hello and welcome once again to What I Did Next from ANT Media, a show where we explore life's pivot points. I'm your host, Malak Fuad. On this show, our guests delve into their personal and professional crossroads and discuss how they choose which way to go. These are people who are multilingual, multicultural, with roots in the Middle East. They are engaged, curious and passionate about knowledge and aiming to leave the world a slightly better place. Today's guest comes from the world of documentary filmmaking, specifically the cinema verité genre. In the studio with me today is multi-award winning director Jehan Nujem. Jehan is an extraordinary filmmaker who has captured the zeitgeist time and time again in her work. She's the engine behind such well-known documentaries as Startup.com and Control Room. More recent films include The Square, The Great Hack, which is available on Netflix, and the series The Vow on HBO, all produced in collaboration with her husband, Karim Amir. Jehan is half Egyptian and half American and was educated in both Egypt and the United States. She moves seamlessly between cultures, looking for the next big story. Being at the center of things has always been how she operates, getting inspired by the forces and winds of change around her. This has been her guiding principle and she has relied on this when choosing her projects. In today's show, we talk about the twists and turns of her career and how she always seems to be at the right place at the right time, capturing pivotal moments and events that have shaped all of our political and social lives. She also shares how things have changed for her now that she's married and a mother to three young children. We open as always with one of the show's staple questions, asking our guests about the people or personalities they'd invite to their ideal dinner party. I couldn't resist having both Jesus and Muhammad there, because I'm sure they'd have a lot to talk about, and there's a lot of interesting, important questions. We could potentially solve a lot of things. Um, personally, I my mentor uh, D.A. Pennebaker passed away uh, last year and I didn't have a chance to say thank you and goodbye and I would love for him to be there because not only would I ha- like to have the chance to say that but he is somebody who is such an incredible conversationalist. Was he a teacher of yours? He's, he's, a, he's a filmmaker. He's made his films with his partner and wife Chris Hedges, so she would definitely come along too. And um, and she, uh, both he and she are people that I made my first film with, um, Startup.com. And um, he's just an, an incredible person. One of these people you meet that even though he's, uh, you know, 85 years old, he still has looks at the world with a kind of childlike wonder um, and an enthusiasm and a curiosity. And he's like that about people too. And how did you meet him? Was it through school? Was it through university? I uh, know I met him because I was um, I had just I, I had been working at MTV and I was working on a show called Unfiltered, which was basically one of these early MTV shows where we sent out cameras to people and they filmed their story and sent the footage back to us. But after a year and a half of shaky camera, I couldn't handle it anymore. <laughs> I wanted to make my own film. Yeah. And so I started making a film about my roommate. Um, at the time, my roommate in New York was starting an internet company. And at the same time, Penny Baker and his wife were looking at uh, VCs that were funding these internet companies and these internet entrepreneurs. And so we met up because we were both making a film about both sides of the situation. And, uh, and he offered to he said listen we can make two films or we can make it together it'll be a lot more fun and had you seen his work before oh yeah you knew who he was oh yeah 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 absolutely I mean he had made films about Kennedy Bob Dylan um you know all of the great musicians um in the 60s interesting so that's three people so far yeah let's see so who so we have them include um 
I never met my grandfather, who uh, lived in, was a family doctor in Port Said, who I would love. He would go around at stories about him. He would just go around on his bike with this little black medical box and just go from family to family um, and treat them. And I would love to meet him. So I would love for him to be there. This is your your father's father. My right? father's father. Okay. So personally, I just I I would have to have my parents there because mm -hmm. uh, and my, and my kids because they would never forgive me if I had <laughs> Jesus and Muhammad at the table and they weren't invited. And I would love for them to have experience it as well because I wouldn't want to just keep, you know, talking about it. I know that's a lot of people. It's an overcrowded it's, dinner it's party. It's your dinner. You can have as many as you like. Oh, okay, okay, okay. <laughs> you can keep going if you want. <laughs> Hatshepsut yeah, is nice. a must. Absolutely. I mean, she's, you know, is the first, I would want to ask her a few questions. Absolutely. Do we know that much about her or is it just a lot of mythology, I think? We don't know very much. Yeah. There's so many questions. I don't know all the right questions to ask, but my sister studied Egyptology, so I would make sure that she has she the could, questions. Yeah. So that's, uh, that's her. And then, So it would be a very serious dinner, actually, right? Yeah, it I definitely, would, would maybe like... I'd have to get Dave. Well, Penny Baker is not a super serious guy. He would be able to, yeah. you know, lighten it up and right. Chris. And I mean, my kids are clowns, so <laughs> that would add some humor. But um, I love Dave Chappelle. I would love for Dave Chappelle to show up. And he's, you know, he, the first time I, I, I spoke with him, he was somebody that was doing, was planning on doing the Hajj. Oh, really? Um, so he hasn't done the Hajj yet, but he converted to Islam. And huh. I wanted to do a film with him, um, which was going to be him ultimately doing the Hajj, but traveling through a bunch of... It was very soon after September 11th, and it was I wanted him to follow him as he went very through a number of different sure. Arab countries, Middle Eastern countries, you know, meet the guy who sells vegetables and have a conversation yeah. with him. Because he's somebody who, you know, there's so many comedians that get people to laugh by making fun and cutting down people. But I don't find his humor to be this way. Mm. I think Dave Chappelle really, he's he's funny without um, destroying people. And I think comedians also have the ability to, to um, take a, a subject that is serious and, and be able to explain it very well to people because they already have that buy-in from the audience. Yeah. You know? And if he was at a dinner with Muhammad and Jesus, they would, you know, the... The results of that conversation Absolutely, yeah. would be, be really interesting. Very, interesting. very and interesting. And he would talk about it probably in a very interesting way. Yeah. We would need some good music. I know, you know, Nina Simone was, you know, at various points in her life, played a number of different roles. I mean, she, but I, I think, um, I mean, we'd, we'd have to, we'd have to bring Nina Simone along. For sure. For some good Should music. Should certainly bring a, a different dynamic to the table. Yeah. Interesting. It's an interesting combination of people. Maybe some Ella Fitzgerald. Yeah, why not? Then I could invite Aladdin's genie and just ask, and then he'd give me three wishes Absolutely. and we could do it all and over again. We could again. do that. So you could just keep, like, it would be a circle that would just ad infinitum. You'd have this dinner that wouldn't end. <laughs> <laughs> The other question I want to ask is um, if you could pick one movie, one book, and one piece of music or, or singer, let's say, that you like, who would you pick? Film is very difficult because they're like, they're... It's hard uh, to pick one, so, right? So hard to pick one. Let's start with, let's start with music. Uh, my father introduced me to some wonderful Arabic musicians and um, I'd have to say Feirouz. We would listen to Feirouz together, and uh, he actually introduced me um, to uh, Suad Masi. I She's amazing. I love yeah, her music. Yeah, I heard her a few years ago. She sings the song Rawi, yeah. like Storyteller, yeah, which is yeah, a beautiful yeah. song. I saw her on stage at a festival, and Joan Baez was there as well. Really? And they really complimented each other. It was really interesting. Oh, wow. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so these are like f folk, Arabic folk music, basically. Uh, yeah, yeah, I love her. And I could imagine, and Joan Baez is, I mean, I love yeah, her. Yeah, yeah, amazing. What about books? Are you a reader? Books, yeah. Although since having kids, I feel like all I read is, you know, how to raise your kid books. Yeah. <laughs> and and nobody or, agrees, or so Seuss. I think I've got to stop reading. Yeah, or Dr. Yeah. Seuss. I could, I could tell you. Read it, I <laughs> 
Green eggs and ham. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, we're learning how to read right now. So, you know, we're reading, you know, Pat sat on s- yep. the cat. Yep. You know. Um, Do you find that your attention span when it comes to reading has diminished with social media and and everything being sort of bite size? A lot of my guests have been saying that to me, and I, for myself, I'm noticing that too. Yeah, I guess I don't know whether to differentiate between whether it's social media or whether it's the kids, because yeah. in the last five years, I feel like my attention is continually pulled from thing to thing to yeah. thing, right? Yeah. Um, I'm reading Childwise right now, which is a great book um, about what is that? child rearing. Oh, and, really? Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah. In terms of novels, I no, I there's so many that I love, but I read one. I read a book recently called Americana. Mm-hmm. Um, it's by a Nigerian author. She's amazing. I read that book. Yeah, Chimamanda Ngozi Adichie. Yes, that's her. I love the nuances of it. Yeah. I love the story. It's really of subtle. Her and how she viewed. Um, you know, how she viewed uh, African-Americans yeah. versus African-African, yeah. you know. As herself. Yeah. yeah, exactly. And it's really interesting how she she sees America because we don't often see America through the eyes of an African. We know a lot about Amer- African-Americans, but not from someone emigrating from, from Africa yeah. and a woman. Yeah. So tell me about film. If you could pick one or two movies. I have so many movies I could recommend. Um, but I, I so I, I vote for the Academy Awards. And so we've just been through it. I've just been watching a lot recently. Um, I just saw a great one called uh, The Mole, um, which is a Chilean film, um, which is has been uh, not nominated yet, but on the short list. Um, and uh, it's about... It's about uh, this PI that's hired to infiltrate this uh, elderly folks' home because the woman thinks that her mother is being abused there. Oh, gosh. So, but is it a comedy or is it... I mean, it's... Because you're laughing. <laughs> I mean, you're following. You're following. It's, it's quite funny. You fo- you're following this guy as he's... As he's, you know, hired to basically go undercover. And okay. he's an older gentleman and he's hired to go undercover in this... In an old people's home. In yeah. an old yeah, people's yeah. home and just basically try to find her and meet her. And it's it's filmed beautifully and it feels like a fiction film, actually. In terms of uh, fiction films... Yeah, so many. I They're all like... it's a, it's a, I'll pick a documentary that really, you know, don't look back... Another, a Penny Baker film mm-hmm. changed my life because mm-hmm. it was I I saw that film and it was following Bob Dylan through his tour of London and I watched it it felt like you were there it was like a time machine um it was the first time I saw film as this ability to this 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 tool to be able to transport people to another place another time and give them the experience of that actually being there and it's in the tradition of verite filmmaking right Mm -hmm. where you're a fly on the wall you're just observing you're not asking questions so you're not kind of disrupting the um, flow of things and it's literally like you're sitting in the 60s with Dylan as he's strumming on his guitar or sitting in the back seat with him and Joan Baez as they're making up a song together and I was just like I want to do that that transitions quite well, actually, to, to going into how you started in all this. How did you, when you decided you wanted to work in film, how did you decide that the verité genre was what you wanted to do and not just be a blockbuster director, for example? I mean, what, what, what was it that you, you were attracted to? Well, I, studied, I started with photography and I went to, um, I mean, I, I was going to be a doctor. So, I mean, I think this my whole career and everything that I've done is basically built on failures. <laughs> well, failures of the plan A, you know, right. or failures so of what the plan was. you were going to be a doctor. Was. You went to college wanting to be a doctor. Yeah, I wanted to be a doctor. I took pre- pre-med classes. This was at Harvard, right? At Harvard. And uh, I took, I think, it was organic chemistry, and I was just like... <laughs> there are other people that are going to be better at this yeah, job than yeah, I am, yeah. you know. And and meanwhile, I was taking all these photography classes and taking refuge in the VES, the visual arts department. At the time, I felt a little bit like I was cheating because I was coming back to Egypt and taking photographs. And it's like, 
you know, I mean, what more visual place do you have than this incredible country to take photographs in? You know, it was a little bit like, you know, my fellow students were taking pictures around Boston and it's yeah, like, and you and your backdrop is the pyramid. Right. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. You know, and I spent a lot of time. I had volunteered for many years in uh, the Zebelin, um, you know, working with the yeah. Association for the Protection of the Environment. Yeah. APE. And APE. Yeah. yeah. And I'd written my thesis. I wrote my thesis ultimately about. Um, the organization and about the work that they did there and so I was doing a lot of photography there at the same time. There was this exhibit that was uh, I'd been asked to show some of the photographs at this conference of population the, the UN conference on population and development and I was really proud of them and after like f two days they said you know I think we should take the picture of the dead donkey out and then after another couple of days, another one got removed. And people were, you know, some of the organizers had been upset. What, they considered it negative? About they, considered, the they considered it negative. Why are you showing these photographs rather than showing showing photographs of the pyramids sure. and the Sphinx and the The more Nile. classical imagery. Right. Yeah, right. yeah. And it was confusing, but it was interesting because it caused all this discussion. And here I was, like this 19-year-old, you know, who had never create had a discussion about anything you know of relevance in any kind of public forum before and it was you know we were having these these intense discussions about whether these photographs should stay up or down and it felt like without even opening my mouth you could take pictures that would make people sort of think and question so you were really attracted to the the, the concept of um of the visual as opposed to audio or written or so it was yeah. that and it was it was documentary style yes right? exactly exactly so so I decided to um of course when I talked to my father and he said okay so I see you're going to Harvard to become a doctor and now you're going to Harvard to be a photographer <laughs> yeah like, yeah but your mom saw the saw the interest in that my mom saw the that I was so passionate about it and I was spending so much time in the dark room and I loved the visual medium and she said you know you've got to follow your heart and your dad my dad felt like I had to follow my heart but he didn't want it to be just a whim right you know Fair and enough. he was and that's, concerned yeah that that's what it was but it was they, it's good to have that sort of you know you've got the good angel on one on one shoulder <laughs> and you've got the questioning <laughs> angel on the other yeah exactly and that's an important thing to have actually it, it yeah. makes yeah it makes you question it yeah, does make you question course. things and and um and in the end they said okay you do you do you do visual arts but you have to take another serious concentration or major and so i did social studies which was sounds like a high school class but <laughs> it's it's actually philosophy yeah. economics and because they were basically like if you go do photography and film you have to be able to or if you become a writer and write as a journalist what are you going to write about what are you going to write about Absolutely. you have to have some kind of context Absolutely. for what you're writing about i want to um go through um the the names and dates of your movies for a very particular reason <laughs> so 2001 you had startup Yes. And this came out um, right when the dot-com crash happened. You obviously had started to, to work on it a year before or two years before when it was when the, the Internet craze was happening. And then in 2004, you had Control Room. And this was about the 2003 campaign in Iraq, right? Yeah, it was really the, the, the media war that was right happening. exactly yeah. and then you had 2013 you had the square mm -hmm. which was as most people know i think it was very much the sort of the movie that catapulted you that as we know was about the arab spring and particularly the egyptian um, awakening or revolution then we have 2019 the great hack which was about facebook and the you you were following a couple of people through that um and cambridge analytica the reason I'm mentioning these yeah. dates um, and obviously the subject of each of these movies is because it's as if you had somehow you were plugged in to the zeitgeist and you knew that those were really important milestones in um, popular culture. So you had the Internet revolution, 
You had the media wars of, of the second Iraq war. You had the Arab Spring. And then you had the whole Facebook, Cambridge Analytica privacy issue. You were there at each one of these points. And your, film, your films came out right at the moment where people were talking about these things. How did that happen? I mean, you can say, great, you did it once. But you've done it like four or five times. And I find that fascinating. And I remember coming to watch, you had done a, um, a screening of Control Room in Cairo at one point. And, you know, we were really, all of us were really involved and, wa you know, yeah. watching the media wars going on. And, and you came out with this movie and it was right about that. It's so funny because you sound like my dad. Because when true, Startup though. when Startup came out, no, but I mean, thank you for saying that. But just the when Startup came out, he said, okay, you know, you did it once. That's a fluke. Okay, now let's find some serious work for you to do. So how did that um, happen? I mean, you, you did I, you begin working on these things? No, you have to begin working on these things two years before. Of course. You know? So you're, you're actually before the side, guys. You're creating it. <laughs> so you want to be, you're looking, you're always looking to be in a situation where you're learning. I mean, that's what attracted me to this whole idea of filmmaking but how did you end up focusing on on these subjects because start up yeah we, we were at that age i guess where it was all around us but yeah. control room for example was not necessarily your world so much so control room was interesting because i was i was actually between apartments in new york and i was staying with one of my college roommates at, at her parents house in new york um, on the upper west side and her parents watch Fox News 24 hours a day. And so I remember I was like, I, you know, I was basically, I started watching it because I was curious about yeah. what Fox was saying. Yeah. And I was at the same time talking with my parents who were in Egypt and hearing about this shock and awe campaign and bombing Iraq into democracy. And mm -hmm. people were terrified of what yeah. was going to happen to the region when Iraq was completely disrupted. Yeah. And so I just, I, I, I thought I have to be in the center of where news is being created because how is it possible that you have a, one part of the world in the US and the West that's understanding, having one understanding because of the media of a situation and you know, the Arab world that was mostly listening to Al Jazeera at that time. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it was everywhere yeah. at that time. Um, who have a completely different understanding of what's going on. How are people even supposed to communicate with each other and who's ma who are making the editorial decisions? Mm -hmm. And so it's kind of like a, you go into these projects with a kind of defiant optimism. Mm -hmm. Like, I'm going to get, I have to get access because somebody, ha I have to be able to see how this all works. Yeah. And I'm going to be able to get access. And so I wrote to... Uh, Nick Frazier at the BBC, who was then the commissioning editor of Storyville, and he was very excited about me doing something and raised the budget really quickly and then found out that there was another team from the BBC that was there making a film. And so he called me literally the day before I was going to get on the plane and he said, I'm sorry, it's a no go. So I said, I, I, this is something I have to do anyway. I called Abdullah Schleifer, who was a yeah. professor at, at AUC. And he had sent a number of interns to work um, at, Al at Al Jazeera at the time. So Abdullah Schleifer calls uh, the managing director of Al Jazeera at the time and says, listen, I have somebody that I know that wants to be filming inside. And at the time, you know, Al Jazeera, I'm the last person that they want to deal with. They don't want to deal but, with a documentary I, filmmaker. No, but also I think Al Jazeera at the time was not the controversial network it became later. Not in the Arab world. Well, in the US, it was considered the mouthpiece of Osama bin Laden. Right. You know, right. like because they had shown all of these bin Laden sure, tapes, sure. right? It was as if in the US, it was like, if I watch a movie about Al Jazeera, I'm going to see Osama bin Laden right. wandering around the hallways, you know, <laughs> getting like, seriously, that's what getting a cup felt. of coffee. Yeah, yeah, seriously. <laughs> and so in a way, you're using that sort of negative curiosity about something in order to... To confound expectations and yes. confound attitudes. Very well said. <laughs> <laughs> I want to move on just briefly to the square. Would you can which of these films would you consider to be for yourself 
the the film that launched you, which gave you the power to yeah. do things in your own way. Different ones in different ways because startup.com really w was popular in the States and I w and was made with these legendary filmmakers. And so in the filmmaking community, mm -hmm. it was it, it was a known film. Right. Uh, Control Room was a theatrical release that was bought by Magnolia Pictures and um, and it did really well in the theaters because it was a time when, you know, we didn't have YouTube yet. So people had never seen these images before. Um, I was a, a, awarded a DGA uh, Directors Guild Award for that, um, as well as con I was nominated for that Control Room and The Square and won it for uh, that and control room or the square I don't remember which but um, but so in the industry mm -hmm. those films really uh, propelled me forward I think the square you were nominated for an Oscar as well right the square yeah. I was nominated for an Oscar um, control room did very well among in the theaters everybody knew about it um, and I think it was because partly because we didn't even have YouTube at the time so it was a film where people were seeing another side to the story mm -hmm. for the first time. Mm -hmm. I mean, people were shocked of the images that they were yeah. seeing. You know, it's not like now when you can turn on YouTube and you can see these these images and another perspective quite easily mm -hmm. if you want. And you can find the, the imagery you want now, whereas maybe then you couldn't so much. Right. Um, and many people felt when they saw Control Room, they compared the U.S. invasion to Vietnam. And so a lot of Americans were really you know, concerned mm -hmm, about mm -hmm. it. Access to control room. I mean, I basically sat in the guards office of Al Jazeera for three days in terms of, and, you know, had this kind of defiant optimism of I'm going to, we're going to get in, of course, mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. we're going to make this film. And it's going to, you have to have a little bit of, um, I was talking to my mother at dinner. She's, you know, American, so we still eat dinner at 6 p.m., you know, um, <laughs> Very before I came here. <laughs> That's lunch in Egypt. <laughs> yes, exactly, exactly. Yeah. So, um, and I was saying, I'm about to do this, this, this thing, and it talks about, you know, do you take the safe decision or not the safe decision? She's like, you've never made a safe decision in your entire life. So, <laughs> so you've always did, taken the risky decision. That's really interesting because that's the whole point of this podcast are, are these jumping off the deep end situations. Yes. And I think it's that I don't want to ever feel like I didn't do something because I was too scared. Right. You know, Have you always felt like that. I've always felt that way. And has that been your kind of way of, uh, of, of being across the board for everything or is it purely in work? You that's know? a very good question. I think, because some people tend to be risk takers in certain things and maybe not in other things. I think I follow my gut yeah. across the board. Okay. And so sometimes that puts you in a situation where you've, you're taking a risky decision, which maybe does not seem as logical as it should. And I've had to change things a lot since having kids because I think there's a, you know, that that's the biggest factor. That's the biggest change that's happened in my life is having three incredible kids that and I'm, in very short space of time and right? in a very short yeah. space of time but all of a sudden it's not you're no longer really thinking about yourself right you know um and you're in this at our age we're we're taking care of kids and we're taking care of parents and I have a sister who I care about a lot but from a very young age I was you know she 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 was born with a hearing loss and so um I think that that always made me since you know watching people treat her in a mean way as kids i think that that always makes you look out for the underdog is she older than you she's older than me although i mean she would say she doesn't need my protection at all and sure. she's you know she's I'm sure she's because of her hearing loss she's she's one of these people that reads a book by turning the page i mean she just you know she can read three books in a day right. she's one of the smartest people i know i mean she's she's amazing um but yeah but she's but it was a tough it was tough growing up. Do you feel that before you had children, you were more fearless in your choices for work? Absolutely. Do you think that that's changed or are you still pretty fearless in your choices? I would say that's changed. I would not make the square right now. I think there's other people that could make a film like that. Um, you know, my role Tell is, me why. Because looking back... You know, at the time, I was um, 
I felt like it was a very important thing to do. I felt like I was watching something unfold that was a piece of history that needed to be documented and would potentially be sort of white whitewashed and wiped away if it wasn't. Um, and you put yourself at risk in that movie. And you, yeah, yeah, I mean, you're in it's kind of a lot of, you know, a lot of people A did, lot of people did. Right? But something good, a lot of things good came out of that movie. You met Karim, your husband, right? It's funny because he... Uh, we, I was working with somebody named Cressida, um, and she was filming. He had set up a stage with his cousin, and there was sort of, there were a number of different stages in the square, and their their stage was the stage where anybody could stand up and read poetry or whatever. And so we wanted to film on the stage, and Cressida was filming on it, and but she was from England, and so it was at a time when he didn't want to be associated with anybody who was foreign, you know, really? because because there was all of this stuff on television, right. if you remember, right. saying that this is infiltrated by spies sure. and all of this. There please. was, again there, were, again, there was a lot of misinformation going yeah. around. Yeah. yeah. So he said, could you please step off the stage? We don't want you filming here. And so she got, you know, annoyed and came back to me and this this guy told me to step off the stage, yeah. you know. And then uh, I didn't meet him at that time, but... um then uh, Raja Omran got mm -hmm. arrested and her sister, and uh, we uh, and we both ended up going to the prison to uh, you know see whether we could mm -hmm. help mm -hmm. get her out. And oh, because Karim knew her, knew yes, them both yes. as well. Okay, yes. and then we were someplace in the middle of not nowhere in Heliopolis, near Heliopolis, yeah. and he offered to drive Cressida and myself back. Right, And we right. were going through all of, the, all of these checkpoints, sure. past curfew, and it took probably like two hours to get back, and we were stopped at every single checkpoint. And I was like, that's, yeah, that was a nice thing to do. Yeah. You know? And it was a very unique time. Yeah. I mean, people sort of found themselves doing things that yeah. they might not have done in other situations. Yeah, you yeah. Know, it was a very, yeah. very unique time. Absolutely. And then we started filming him. I've never actually looked at that footage. We started filming him, and then at a certain point, he said, you know, I don't want to be a character in your film, but you definitely need a <laughs> producer. Would Can I be the producer? And so... Had he done Had he done movies before? Had he done film before? He, he had done some film at NYU, and uh, but he, that's not what he was doing in Egypt yeah. at the time. Was that film for you a major pivot? It was a pivot in terms of the fact that it really got out there. The Oscar nomination, even though I hate to say that these awards make a difference with anything because there are so many incredible films that never get yeah. any of these awards. Sure. Um, and I want to say something about that, actually. Just talking about something that inspired me when I met Penny Baker is here is this legendary filmmaker and the first time I meet him, I go into his office and I had seen the big films that he had done, like Don't Look Back or The War Room about Clinton's election or whatever. And he says, let me show you this amazing little film that I made. And he pulls out this film and it's called Victoria and he puts it in and I'd never seen it before. And I was a bit embarrassed that I'd never seen it before. And I said, it's an I watched it, beautiful film. I've never seen it before. I'm so sorry. And he said, Oh no, half of these films nobody's ever seen, but that doesn't mean that you love them yeah, any less. Yeah. But that's really hard as a filmmaker to to accept that. It's very hard to sort of think about uh you know, the fact that you're going to work on this film for a long period of time and then nobody ever sees it. But I'll tell you, listening to him say that was absolutely freeing because if you think about it 50 years from now, you'd rather have a film that yeah. is unsuccessful that you're proud of than a film that's successful that you're not proud of. But I also right. think that the, I, I understand how that is freeing for you. That was a very freeing moment hearing him yeah. kind of say yeah. that and then living that way, living by, okay, it's it's the right thing to do to follow your gut. And, to and have you done that with every single production that you've worked on or have some had to have a slightly more commercial it's never worked for me to mm -hmm. be honest mm -hmm. i thought that i was doing that with the great hack and we started to make a film about the sony hack we said this is going to be a, a film that's going to be quick and easy to do we'll basically do it in a year we'll get it's a commission by netflix we'll film all of the executives at sony it's this very interesting coming together of politics and tech and entertainment and then at the same time, this whole election, the Cambridge Analytica, Cambridge thing, Analytica yeah. thing was happening. And yeah. we were like, we can't, we've, we've, this is, we've got to do is this. It. This yeah. is it, yeah. you know? Yeah. And so you can't, I, I've never been capable of doing that. Probably if I was more efficient, I would have been able to do the 
Sony hack film and then also yeah. do the other but one. They but kind of, they kind of melt, yeah, I mean, yeah, they we still it a little bit together, you know. We still have yeah. all of the footage from the Sony hack film. Yeah. People have said yeah. we should go make it. What about the projects that you wanted to do? Or the, the the projects that you you know you, you followed the failures yeah the failures or the things that you know you followed and you're like this is it this is it and then somehow along the line it didn't happen but you're like you're kicking yourself now or you know you you felt that there was something there and you wish you had managed to do it I filmed Best and Yusuf very early on and then somebody else ended up coming in and making a film about him yeah and. Um, I, I didn't want to, I didn't think that there could be two. You couldn't do two on that. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I think that that, you know, that would have been fun. Uh, but I, I'm trying to think of other failures. Not now. I mean, I wouldn't consider them failures, Jahan. I mean, I've had a lot of, I've had a lot of failures, so there's plenty no, no, to no, choose from. I, I don't think of them as failures. I yeah. think of them as, you know, you, you've, you've followed your gut. You've gone down the path where you're like, okay, this is the story I want to pursue. And somehow it just didn't materialize or you weren't able to, to see it through. Look, I feel like when I, so I won the TED Prize in 2006. And do you know, I don't, if you know what the TED Prize is, they, at, it, they've changed it. But when I won the TED Prize at that time in 2006, they ask you to make a wish for the world. And it's basically make this huge wish for the world. And you did Pangea Day. And I did Pangea Day. Yeah. Pangea Day was 1,800 locations in over 100 countries of the world. Um, four hours of music and film uh, and speeches meant to and translated into local languages. The sort of the center of it was was conflict and standing in another person's shoes and Israel Palestine became okay. the, the so center of the whole, whole thing. Um, and it, that was that was tough. I mean, that was uh, there was and a you situation. And you that, right? Yes. Yeah. And it turned into TEDx. So that was the, that part of it was successful because TEDx has become came out of that. Sure. Came out of that, sure. and it and it, it's become you know one of TED's greatest products. But I felt like it was it wasn't a success in that. I never, I always wanted it to be much smaller little meetups around the world. I never thought that it should be this, these gigantic events. You wanted more intimate events, you know? More of an intimate feel. Yeah, yeah. And we had to do, at that time, we were told that we had to do these big events because we couldn't get sponsorship, like Nokia sponsorship or whatever, unless they were these huge events. Right. Now I think people would understand yeah. more the idea of having yeah. like small ga small gatherings of men. But you, you had to kind of do the big thing in order for people now to do the small thing. Yeah. You know? Yeah, I think you so. You had to pave the way in a way. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 And that, that was the first time I came across some an interesting, there was a board member of TED who was Israeli that stood quite strongly against some of the content and asked them not to ask me to remove part of the content. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I really had to stand up and say, I don't want this prize then if mm -hmm. uh, you're going to make me remove some of the content. And what happened? And ultimately, uh, Ted said, okay, go with it. Really? Yeah. That's impressive. But it was very, it was it was tough because you just realized how, you realized how, how media across the world and in the mm -hmm. U.S. works and that yeah. it's, it is these wealthy board members yeah. that are able to influence sure. things. And, yeah. it, and it's in your face. Yeah. You know, we're doing this to give a platform for people that don't have a voice. And now you're telling me that I have to remove yeah. some of those people. And what about other forms of censorship and other productions you've worked on? Have you uh, come across that? I've been very lucky in that. And, and, and where I've pivoted to, I would say, I, I was making very low budget films and what the square was able to do was bring on some people that some investors and people that really believed in us and can even my work to put in money early on in order to maintain a an independence. And so when we made the square, when it got nominated and all of that, we met a ton of incredible people. Um, and I mean, we met uh I, I remember walking down the red carpet and we met Angelina Jolie and Brad Pitt and right. they loved the square. Wow. And it was, and we met Brad Pitt, Brad Pitt said, Angie, Angie, come here. These are the <laughs> filmmakers behind the square. And Angie was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. You have to, I, I want to follow your next project. I want to follow what you're doing. Def, call me. Amazing. And she walks so you away. Another she walk, well, <laughs> and she walks away and Kareem and I look at each other and we're like, 
call her? Like, yeah, how, yeah, yeah. What is My that? New buddy what is Geneva. exactly? Yeah. Like, and we meet her. We met her about a year and a half later, and she said, "Hey guys, you guys haven't called." That's so and we funny. Were, we were like, "Well, we don't." really have your number yeah, 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 so yeah. i don't know how we're yeah. supposed to call you it's Hollywood speak, <laughs> exactly <right? laughs> so so her her assistant okay she said she had her assistant come over and then we we started a conversation with her and then we ended up making a film with her we made we made a film called the breadwinner and she came on and produced with us because of that meeting yeah. so you know well, she's taken on interesting independent projects as well along she the way she really has yeah. in our first meeting for the breadwinner she came and said what part of Afghanistan is it? What dialect yeah, are you going to? Yeah. I mean, she was really spot she was on. on with she's all. on top of her stuff. Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah, Absolutely. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was, uh, you know, that Interesting. was. Interesting. So, Jahan, tell me, what will you do next? Well, I'm, I, you asked me about commercial success, and, you know, I, I started making the, the vow mm -hmm. with HBO two years ago. We started it independently again, and then again, by, we started the vow independently because we have these incredible funders, people that believe in us, really people who are sort of independently um, want to make sure that there's these independent films that get out mm -hmm. there and that are made without the influence of big studios. With integrity and, yeah. and, and as a whole, yeah. Yeah, so that's been, I mean, that's been amazing. They've been our partners on this group of people have been our partners on the last three films and including the vow mm -hmm. and then the vow ended up becoming a series and um was very successful for hbo it was the the fifth they did the numbers on it and it was the fifth most watched doc series globally and it's a what a 10 part series it's it's nine parts <laughs> and you're working on series two, and we're right? working on part two and Amazing. part two will be probably six or seven parts and is that a project that's going to take you what the next year next two years yeah we'll be done by the end of this year and do you work on other things simultaneously or do you take on one thing at a time so Karim is better th at that than I am yeah. um, Karim is working on a film about the Lincoln project right now and also a film about Boeing I mean, I, I experienced it when I worked with Chris and Penny Baker, mm -hmm. and I saw them, how they, you know, lived together, had kids together, made films together, you know, how is got that, together. Got how it, is it easy, or do you each compartmentalize? You each have a role in your work. When you're shooting, when you're filming yeah. it, it's like you're you're such a team, and then you get divorced in every edit. <laughs> that's hilarious. Where it's basically like, you know, that that's that's yeah. where the conflict comes. And what is it, like comes... screaming matches? Or how does it work? <laughs> no, 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 no. Um, well, I'm a Taurus. He's a Scorpio. So, you know, like he, I get the lash of the tail yeah, and yeah, I just yeah, go yeah, in yeah, like yeah, the yeah. bull. And, yeah. No, it's... Uh, uh, we're actually good working together. Um, I think the kid, the, it's having kids and balancing all of yeah. these things that um, is is the challenge. But at the same time, I can't imagine doing it with somebody who I wasn't working with because my my love affair has always been my work, you know. And then and now it's my work, my family, and my kids. And so when I decide to go on a trip to film something, it's a real sacrifice leaving mm -hmm. these guys but behind. But I think you've and been so, pretty lucky also because so far your kids are so young that yes. you've been able to go around yes. as, as a unit, yes. right? And it's like, and when you're making, deci you're making decisions together, you know, yeah. and you're making decisions about, and, and, and we both know it's very difficult to quantify how useful a shoot will be, right? But when you're working with somebody, there's an unspoken language and you understand how sure, important sure. or not important it is. I want to thank Jahan for being so generous with her time for this chat and thank you all for joining me on this episode of What I Did Next. The show is brought to you by a and Media with me, Malak Fouad, and is co-produced by Shirag Desai. I love hearing from you, so please connect with us on Instagram by searching for What I Did Next. I really hope you can join us again in two weeks' time.